Canada. Uh, this is Rowan, and I'm um, going to fill my pill pods and ramble on about some stuff and nonsense. So, uh, what's going on? So, I have... Moving the cord around. Uh, so I had a thought. Might want to open these. I had a thought. I've been having some thoughts. Uh, I still haven't watched the uh, the full two-hour... I think it was originally a live stream from... What's her name? Uh, Cadaver Kelly's uh, channel, is that? But, interestingly, uh, a couple days before that... Uh, happened, and I don't remember seeing an announcement about it, just because, like, I don't know, I check YouTube once a day, um, usually, and the reason for that is just, it's the same reason I check Twitter once, maybe twice a day tops, and only with, uh, with Twitter, I check it once a day top, ideally once a day, twice a day tops, and when I check it, I set myself a time limit of like 20 minutes. Uh, with Facebook, I check once a day tops and set myself a time limit of 15 minutes. So, um, reasons are slightly different for each of those. Just, uh, I don't like getting sucked into everybody's petty little dramas and all of that. It took me a few days to even realize the, that, um, ContraPoints cancelled. Uh, I like Natalie, and I understand, like, where her comments were coming from, and honestly, like, when I noticed that, I went on this huge rant on, um, on Twitter. Yeah, I'm getting sidetracked. So, I first mentioned, uh, Cadaver Kelly. Um, her, uh, her live stream on her channel with, uh, Skullgirdle R.I.P. and Radically Dark about, um, 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 uh, Gen X, Y, N, Z, Goths, uh, about, uh, and my guess is talking about some of the generational differences and some of it, you know, the commonalities between people. Uh, Cadaver Kelly, she's in the area of about my age, um, I think I might be a year or two older, um, depending on the, uh, the generational charts you're looking up. I'm either um, the youngest end of Generation X or the oldest end of Millennials. Uh, some um, generational charts will colloquially refer to that little liminal area that I'm at as Gen Y, uh, just because yeah, you've got some commonalities in with both. Honestly, I think in no small part because my parents were both almost 40 when I was born. I have a cultural lens that is a bit off from most people about my age. And yeah, my parents each had a kid before I was born. Uh, so my eldest half-sister on my mother's side, that's because my mother was a Frank Zappa groupie, and unfortunately that sister has passed. Um, but yeah, she was, she's about 12 and a half years older than me, or uh, was. Um, and then my dad's eldest, who's my only living sister and only a half-sister, you know, genetically speaking, uh, she's about seven years older than me. And then what happens? So yeah, I, I have two sisters, um, far more, one more than five years older than me, one more than ten years older than me, and the funny thing about that is, uh, plus, like I said, my parents were both almost 40 when I was born, so this gives me this really odd perspective. I find that I generally have more in common with other young Gen Xers who might, you know, be only slightly older to, you know, the mid-range um, Gen X-born people who would be born, like, late 60s, very early 70s. Um, a lot of my exes were at least... Oh, God, yeah. Most of my exes were at least seven years older than me. And considering that I... I don't know, when, when I'm... When we're talking about, you know, that more, like, 
attention grabbing, you know, physical levels of attraction. <laughs> I like them young and stupid, but um, I just added these. Why did I put it back in the box? Okay. Uh, but yeah, when we're talking about, you know, something that's going to last a bit more long term, I tend to go for a little bit older. Yeah, at least seven years my senior. Um, which is just, I don't know, th th those are just the personalities that mesh a little better with mine. It's so, so, I don't know. <laughs> but that's another story for another time. So yeah, I was talking to, uh, to my friend Adrienne. I chat with her a lot about uh, things, especially the weird little generational differences amongst goths. Now, I was living it. I'm probably not the most objective perspective, um, just because there's going to be, you know, a, a natural bit of bias based on the fact that I was there. Like, while first-hand accounts of, you know, a lot of events and all that is really helpful in a lot of ways when, when, uh, when taking historical accounts, there are certain elements to all sorts of um, historical and cultural events. You know, whether, well, I guess it's all historical, so like, you know, like whether it's like more social history or political history and all of that, there are certain things that can be really observed objectively from an outsider's perspective. Like, um, like yeah, th th there's nothing quite like a first-hand experience, but at the same time, that's both good and bad. <laughs> like, there's nothing quite like it if you really want to mess some stuff up. Uh, which is one of the reasons that it's... I generally am kind of apathetic to the notion of surveillance cameras for stuff, because um, you can indeed be fooled by your own eyes and see only what you think happened. But I digress. So uh, when speaking with Adrienne about... Uh, some of the generational differences I've noticed um, when I go on to uh, the alt gothic archives the you know the Usenet archives are all on uh, Google groups now and technically alt gothic is still kind of going in the Google groups format um, since it's absorbed all of Usenet but you know kind of just barely I, I think there's all of like two people who I know um, to be posting on there regularly. Um, one is a Facebook friend I've met at a couple of convergences. And now I'd say maybe three or four who are, you know, definitely on alt-gothic, now in the Google Groups format, regularly enough that it's not fair to say, all, you know, that all of Usenet is dead, because technically there are some people still using it. It's just like, it had to move to this new platform on Google, and, but I digress. So I go onto the archives sometimes just to pull out examples because as a loudmouth with internet access, I've been a know-it-all for quite some time. I was a know-it-all back when I was like five and reading all kinds of books about stuff. Like I... Like, as young as, like, five and six years old, I would try to best adults in arguments. And, of course, adults were more entertained by this than not, especially when I was talking about whatever kind, uh, whatever kind of, like, little science-y thing I was reading about at the time. A lot of times, bugs and dinosaurs. I really loved bugs and dinosaurs as a little kid. Uh, also, big cats. I loved, um, big cats, as in, like, lions and tigers and, um, jaguars and all of that. So, so yeah, just because I'm, like, a loudmouth know-it-all with internet access, of course, I often refer to the, uh, alt-gothic archives for various things I'm trying to prove to people, and while there were definitely a lot of conversations had on Usenet, uh, like, trying to nitpick some of the finer points of genre, it was generally accepted back in the mid to late 1990s when so yeah, there were definitely discussions about genre and like some of the finer points, but at the same time, it seemed more like more in the realm of like hypothetical and okay, like sure, we could say we could argue like some of the finer points of like what makes this, you know, gothic rock while this 
one is more gothic metal. Like, oh my gosh, people can still nitpick like whether or not uh, Fields of the Nephilim is gothic rock or gothic metal, and they're both right. I really need to resume my three-part series on that. Uh, so yeah, the ways that we talked about genre back in the days when Usenet ruled the internet, it felt different. And when I go back and reread things, it looks different. It looks different compared to what I see people devoting pages and pages of Reddit our goth comments to. And the reason it looks and feels different to me is because it was, at that time, generally accepted that there was certainly more to goth music than simply gothic rock, dark wave, and maybe half the so-called post-punk. I really hate that term. I really do. I've kind of resigned to the notion that there are some 80s alternative bands, you know, like, they're not exactly the most mainstream pop, but they're not quite idiosyncratic enough to other um, more niche genre to be really referred to as anything else. E like, even if they are closely associated with certain uh, subcultures that existed in the 80s and still exist now, like Echo and the Bunnymen, I would definitely say uh, have far more devoted fans who consider themselves goth than they don't. Same with about, like, half the stuff by The Jam that you could easily say, okay, this is just some kind of post-punk, but what it is, right? Um, but yeah, like, and that's the thing that I hate about post-punk, is that uh, when the term first came about, it was not at all referencing um, genre as in theory. Uh, Post-punk refers to a movement, thus, um, as evidenced by the, uh, by, by the, um, by the suffix punk, um, or the prefix of post, um, before the primary, uh, word of punk, this would be that which came after punk, but through the addition of the root punk still feels a you know, that it has more in common with the root genre of punk than it has with, um, with anything else. So, yeah, there's, so yeah, like, post-punk wasn't, it's not a genre, it's a movement, and it is a movement, it is a reactionary movement against the commercialization of punk, which was really explosive in 77, 78. So, um, 78, 79, this is where we see the beginnings of the post-punk, um, reaction. And, but I digress. So, like, when we go to the, on to alt-gothic, and in fact, like, there is an old, like, alt-gothic, um, FAQ about, you know, like, an old alt-gothic FAQ. Like, stuff that People who were regulars on the Usenet group Alt Gothic uh, made it, you know, like wrote up as, you know, like what is goth? And even when we go on to Usenet and like as posts as late as 99, 2000, 2001, and 2, uh, when people were still just regularly enough, like before it went on a really sharp decline in usage. I would say was about 2001-ish was when it was all but, you know, barely posted to. Um, so yeah, like, even, even like the latest regular posts by more than just these three or four people, uh, still going strong for whatever reason. Um, those last couple years, like, we still see a lot of people referring to goth, um, yeah, like, yes, it's definitely a music-based subculture, but, um, not only is there, uh, more to goth music than gothic rock, dark wave, and post-punk, or half of the post-punk that is arguably more gothic than not, it's like, you know, we also, 
listen to a lot. Like, old farts like me, we have no problem accepting that, you know, avant-garde musicians like Diamanda Galas and Fad Gadget and... Shit. Cat. Who is that other guy I'm thinking? Well, D D Daniel Dax. She's a li little bit more on the pop end, as evidenced by the alt-gothic FAQ. I should link in the description below. Again, if I forget, please remind me to add it there, because... There goes my brain, right? A lot of people. A lot, a lot of people. See, like I said, um, Demonica Loss, Fad Gadget, Daniel Dax, just like a lot of weird arty people, like, oh god, Genesis Peorage and Psychic TV, just like doing whatever the fuck. But it was a bit darker than it wasn't, but it wasn't really, you know, it didn't really go along with anything else, but uh, Goths have always championed th these musicians, and... We see no issue with this, but I will literally get into arguments with people on Reddit saying, Well, I don't care how old you are or how long you've been a goth. I, I'm telling you, Wikipedia says this isn't goth music. This is avant-garde. I'm like, so? So what? I, I don't know. Like, there's a point where you can, like... like Genre theory is all well and good, and it makes for some great intellectual exercises about you know, ab about the ways that human beings like to categorize things, but then again, like, as we see in nature, <laughs> humans can categorize things into all of these weird little groups, all we like, but nature's gonna do what it's gonna do. Like, there are videos of you know, that scientists will, like, put cameras all through these wooded areas, and even when there is an abundance of vegetation deer can eat, and do eat, and will eat, every once in a while, a, a doe will, like, you know, like, go looking through the trees, um, munching on some leaves, and then very intentedly eat baby birds right out of the nest. These are things that happen. Like, um, this is, this is a thing that happens. Like, e even, like, like, she will even go to a nest, you know, back on a tree that she had just passed by and, you know, just, like, go back. Uh, oh, yep, still a bird, birch. Uh, so, yeah, like, herbivores. Herbivores. We categorize them as herbivores. A lot of people believe that deers are completely vegan. No. <laughs> no. It, it is not, and it's not a case of like, oh, well, it's just situational. Like, there was no other food. Like, no, no, this is happens. This happens. Like, even when there is an abundance of vegetables, vegetation, that a deer will eat. Like, she'll still go back and eat baby birds right out of the nest. Because, yeah, you know, all herbivore means, apparently, is that they predominantly eat vegetation, but every once in a while they'll still eat other animals, smaller ones, um, and not just as a matter of survival, or but as a matter of, that's just how they do, right? <laughs> that's just how they do. That's just what nature does, is, you know, it doesn't care a flying crap what kind of little categories we make up for things as people. Because that's just all just us entertaining ourselves and trying to understand the world we live in. Nature's going to do what it does. So when, I, so when I say goth is a music-based subculture, I am not just talking about like, oh, all you need is to listen to the music, as a lot of people claim. Because if that's all that was necessary, that's not a subculture, that's a fandom. That's a fan club. Like, my stepmother was president of, well, local chapter, Lenaway County president of the Billy Ray Cyrus Achy Breaky Hearts fan club. All that was required was that you be a fan of Billy Ray Cyrus. Like, that's it. Like, if goth is nothing more than a fan club for a genre or two of music, then that's not the same as a subculture. The Billy Ray Cyrus fan club, Achy Breaky Heart fan club, was not a subculture. It was a fan club. 
Uh, so when I say that goth is a music-based subculture, I'm looking more to uh, the Belle Epoque of 19th century Paris. I'm looking to um, Weimar Berlin's cabarets in the 1910s and 20s and very early 30s, like up through about like 1930-31. Um, I am thinking of the... Um, American uh, flappers and chics, um, though the latter term is usually retroactively applied. That wasn't really a term for the m male counterparts to flappers in the 20s and early 30s um, at the time. But um, so yeah, in the, in the U.S. it was like flappers and chics or the jazz set. Uh, in the U.K. Um, we see the terms bright young things and caf the cafe society because these were young people, like older, like aged approximately 16 to 25, so very much young adults who would, um, you know, like go and like spend their days in cafes and coffee houses and then go to clubs listening to a hot jazz and early, like, you know, what would later become known as swing bands um, and just like listen to the music and dance and discuss philosophy and art and literature and then engage in these um, in, in these other gatherings around music. So these are all music-based subcultures, like uh, the, the Belle Epoque um, cabarets, like the Moulin Rouge um, in the 19th century. This was a, this was a gathering ground for a music-based subculture because there were bands playing. It was music-based, because this is where they came to congregate and discuss their ideas and the art and the literature and philosophies and religion and social changes and make things happen. And it's awful that so much of that music has been lost uh, through some combination of, like, so a lot of these musicians at that time Honestly, a lot of them couldn't read music, and so therefore they couldn't write down notation, but they remembered it through repetition and, um, and, and all. So that's how they would play in these cabaret orchestras. Uh, some cabaret orchestras, like, nobody could read music at all. They just, like, figured it out as they were writing it, but unable to write it down uh, because... <laughs> You know, they could barely read or write, you know, in, like, French written language, much less in music, but they would learn it through repetition, from, through repeating it and writing it down, and that's how they would remember it. And so that's how a lot of that music has become lost, but it was still very much a music-centered subculture, because this is where they would come and center themselves and focus on their ideas. So when I go see old Usenet archives just to explain my point and back this up with history, it's not just an old person um, doubling down on old ideas. It's an old person reminding people what subculture actually means, that it's more than just being in a fan club for a thing. Like, if the Belle Epoque was just people who enjoyed the illustrations of Henri uh, Toulouse-Lautrec. That's not a subculture, that's a fan club around a very specific thing. <laughs> um, you know, the, the Weimar cabarets were not just about, you know, this one uh, painter or photographer or this one singer. It was about the it was about the music and the art and the literature and the ambiance. So when I refer to old alt gothic stuff that says that yes, you know, goth a big important part of goth of the goth subculture is the music. This is absolutely important. But so are these other things as well. It's all equally important because it's more than a fan club. It's a subculture. Like, a subculture is defined as... 
as a small um, cultural movement semi-removed from the parent culture. And when I say semi-removed, it means that in some ways it reflects the parent culture and in some ways it's a reaction against the parent culture. Um, but it does retain some relevance to the parent culture. But what makes up a culture? It's more than just a language. It's more than just a few pop musicians. A culture is made up of more than just like a few sociopolitical ideals. A culture is made up of all these things. Therefore, a subculture is made up of more than just a music fandom. And it has to be, to be a viable, long-enduring subculture. It has to be. Like, the reason that the flappers of the 1920s they didn't so much die as they became something else, but they became something else because what they represented was no longer especially relevant. Like, that's why you don't really see flappers anymore outside of historical reenacting, um, or people very enthusiastic about vintage you know, fashion and stuff. Like, even people who are enthusiastic about vintage fashion, like, barely in you know, um, they, they barely engage with the music, even, of the Flappers, which was very much a music-based subculture. It wasn't just about, you know, having skirts that came up to, you know, just below the knee, because <laughs> that was a short skirt in 1923. That was a short skirt in 1929. No, it wasn't just about, you know, the fashion. It was also, you know, a lot of it was also about the music and these ideas. But, you know, the, the Flappers morphed into something else, and I have a rant about this, but yeah, the Flappers didn't so much um, die out as they morphed into something else, that their relevance was usurped by something else, and what were once Flappers, um, I honestly think that a lot of what became the mods, the earliest mods, in the late 1950s and early 60s. Uh, mods in the UK, beatniks in the US, um, and then we have the early to mid 60s uh, UK mod scene, which was a little bit less what it was in the late 50s, early 60s, but that's another story for another time. But yeah, they, the, the flappers didn't so much die out as they became something else, but um, we, and I say they became. Um, 60s beatniks and, um, or American beatniks in, say, 1957, and British mods, also 1957, early mods, known as modernists at the time, uh, they became that. And I say that because we see a lot of the same themes recurring when those subculture, you know, when that later subculture of beatniks and modernists uh, emerged approximately 1957-58. Um, that was basically a new take on, you know, the, the 20s jazz set. We see a lot of uh, themes becoming relevant again. It's another post-war era. It's another um, resurgence of jazz music. It's another resurgence of... Um, women finding their own identity just for the sake of themselves um, as, you know, and not needing validation from men in their lives, even if they are perfectly fine with men in their lives and more than happy to have men in their lives. Uh, it's about, you know, so we see these ideals again coming back and goth is very different from that, though I can make an argument that there is a direct line from mods to goths, but that's another thing for another time. And I guess my point is, hopefully some of this is just a thing where I'm being old and you grow into this kind of mindset when you get older and you realize that, you know, it is definitely more than this one thing that I'm very passionate about because I'm 17 and kind of a dumbass. Because we all are when we're 17. Like, if I say nothing else relevant in this video, it's going to be that. We're all a little stupid when we're 17. 
but you know, and we can all get really excited and really hyper focused on one thing when we're 17 and somehow uh, believe that that's all there is to, you know, a fire. And if you catch the reference, you're at least as old as me. Or maybe you just really love old music like myself. And, you know, I'm really hoping some of this is just like a mindset that you age into, that you realize that this thing that I'm passionate about. Yeah, it is definitely more than just this one thing. Um, but maybe it is generational, and maybe, um, you know, the younger people who see it as, um, as so much more than just the music, even though the music is kind of necessary, because th this is, this is our, this is our Weimar Cabaret. This is, this is just how we define ourselves. This is where we come to relax and unwind is the clubs and Spotify playlists and internet radio stations that play gothic music, which is more than just gothic rock, right? It's more than just gothic rock, dark wave, and maybe a handful of post-punk bands. It's also avant-garde music. It's dark cabaret, which people have been playing since literally the beginnings of goth, <laughs> regardless of what people say, it is apocalyptic folk, it is it is industrial noise, it is music that exists in this liminal space where people can be equally correct in making arguments that it is somehow both gothic rock and gothic metal, such as Fields of the Nephilim and Honestly, I'm gonna say it, typo negative. Like, there's a lot of typo negative songs that are just straight up gothic rock with maybe an element or two of heavy metal. And I am not crazy because I am not the only person of my age or older or even younger who can hear that. So, yeah, I I'm. I don't know. Maybe it's a generational thing, or maybe it's just something that you come to accept as you get older, that, you know, this this thing I've dedicated my life to is so much more than this, this one, maybe two things. That it is, it is, it is broad. It is a fully formed, fleshed out subculture that has certainly taken influence from all sorts of things, but, you know, meaning that it is necessarily more than just one thing because like i said if it's if it's just a a collection of people focused on one thing or even one or two things that's not a subculture that's that's a fan club that's a fan club and i have not been a member of a fan club for 25 years because th that would just be sad <laughs> No, I'm I'm a member of a fully fleshed out, fully formed subculture that knows what it is and it will grow and it will endure because there are other people who get it. Because if it was just one or two things like the Achy Breaky Heart Club, that dissolved 20 years ago. That doesn't exist anymore. But you can't say that about goth. Goth has been going over 40 years, and there's a reason for that. Because if it was just music, it would have become something else already. Like, the flappers became beatniks, not because they weren't into jazz, but because the jazz they were into was something very different. And the politics that they were into and the philosophies they were into had certainly evolved and the literature that they appreciated had a much different voice than it did when they were flappers. So, but goth endures because even when we have new authors and visual artists and filmmakers that we enjoy. We can see clearly 
um, where it came from. We can see that there is a common thread to all of this that endures. Like, new gothic rock, it does not sound exactly like older gothic rock, but it does sound very much like gothic rock. And, and that's why it is gothic rock. You know, it's not exactly the same. It's just new. And, like I said, that's, that's why the flappers became something else. They had to, because uh, what the flappers represented was no longer relevant by the 1950s. And yet a goth from 1980 would be recognizably goth to goths in 2019. They'll be recognizable to goths in 2029. Because it's more than just a thing that it, you can be a fan of, and it's more than just one thing. It is, it is, it is indeed a fully fleshed out, enduring subculture, and very endearing to my heart. Right, Nigel? Nigel's right here, but. I know if I turn around and put the camera on him, he's going to move, because that's just what he does. But yes, he's my panther boy. So, yeah, I gotta go put away my half and half, and into the kitchen, maybe shower, and um, hit the post office, and edit down this video to things. So, yeah, that's about, that's about where I want to wrap up this thought, that... You know, fan clubs will dissolve as soon as the fans move on, but a, a fully fleshed out subculture will endure as long as it's relevant. And yeah, that's, that's why you don't see too many beatniks anymore either, outside of, again, reenactors. <laughs> um, Hippies have endured for good and for bad. Hippies have endured. They've definitely changed their hair in a lot of ways. They've def you know, the music has become newer, but hippies still like folk music. Hippies still like rock m music that does weird experimental but psychedelic kind of things. Hippies have endured. Damned if I know why. Um, but yeah, disco, disco, uh, disco queens have not endured because it ceased being relevant. Punk has endured. I've seen people argue very concisely that punk existed long before punk. And yeah, in the 80s, goth wasn't even goth yet, but there was something that brought us all together, uh, you know, with these bands, uh, but also this literature and these films and all of that. So, yeah, um, hopefully goth will endure another 40 years. It'll be one of those little anomalies that amongst subcultures, because, you know, we see them um, come together and then just kind of fade away after 20 years a lot of times. But uh, I think the advent of recorded music has had a lot to do with that, that, but that's, that's another rant for another time, or I'm going to be here for another hour, and I'm never going to get my mail, and all of that, so, bats and kisses, wear your sunscreen, uh, like if you liked it, dislike if you just want to mess with me, because I know you liked it, uh, subscribe and bell thing if you haven't already, if you think more of these brain spews are entertaining enough to at least keep an eye on this crazy person here sitting on his floor, sometimes a wicker chair, sometimes standing around in his kitchen or his bathroom, um, sometimes being invaded by cats. And uh, if you have more dollars than cents, I have a PayPal um, link in the description box. I also have a Patreon. I have a new single coming out next month on Mystic Fragments Records. And I also have an Amazon wish list because my food stamps allowance has been completely borked up. It's been cut almost in half, and I just got a letter yesterday saying that they've reduced me by another four dollars after this month. So yay! Feel free to get me a case of almond milk if you want, or at least a gift card to Whole Foods. So that's and kisses, and take care of yourselves, and goodbye.